This one time in Kazakhstan, or was it Kyrgyzstan? Well, let me back up. This one time in Kyrgyzstan, on the heels of barely avoiding an armed insurrection, my delicious time in Bishkek was coming to an end. My host, Boris, waited with me outside the safe house, or temporary apartment, for my driver who would escort me along the many dusty hours to Almaty, Kazakhstan. Boris highly recommended just one more street snack before departing, and off he ran to buy me some hot and crispy samsa, essentially the Kyrgyz samosa. But just as he returned, Vlad rolled up. Samsa goes in the bag. Vlad was an excellent valet, with the capability of but one English word that becomes important later. He slowed when winding around blind mountain bends. He beeped as he passed fellow motorists. He paid the correct police fee when pulled over for driving with a foreigner. He even stopped to show me a lovely tourist attraction that he described with the word boom and arms gesturing in the shape of a mushroom cloud. Um, time to go, Vlad. We arrived at the Kazakh border. Vlad points me to a check station and I hop out with my passport and the now cold bag of Samsa in case I had to wait. Immigration was a breeze and I sailed through the line, popped out the other side to see... No, Vlad... My mind reeled with the possibilities of what would happen if I just started walking. So, there I sat, me and my passport. Well, me, my passport, and the scrumptious beef and caramelized onion samsa. Those 40 minutes dragged on, when from about 300 paces I hear, Boom! Boom! And a tiny figure with arms waving wildly, as I instinctively yet inanely yelled, What the hell, Vlad? My name is Howie Southworth. I travel, I eat, I cook, and then I write fancy words about all of it. My cookbooks are loaded with wild stories and fabulous bites, and I've shared plenty of my own adventures. But now, I want to hear somebody else's for a change. Sauced in Translation is a timely podcast spanning the globe of food, spinning tales of lavish meals and epic gastronomic failure. Join us for some well-deserved armchair globetrotting. Let's get saucy. My guest today is Megan McCormick. For several years, Megan was one of the spectacular presenters on a series that went by a variety of names depending on where you were watching in the world. Globe Trekker, Pilot Guides, or Lonely Planet TV, which of course was associated with the popular travel guides. If you've ever enjoyed Andrew Zimmern for his culinary bravado, Anthony Bourdain for his fates be damned intellect, or Rick Steves for his academic frugality. You watched Megan McCormick to see how much fun and enlightening it could be to roam the globe. She was last featured on a series called Sea Nation, in which she dropped off the hamster wheel to shift that fun to island hopping. But most related to our favorite topic, if you have not seen Megan McCormick dive into Sichuan hot pot replete with tongue-numbing peppercorns, you've not lived. Here's our chat. So, Megan, Sichuan hot pot. I love it, but I'm a wuss and I stick to the mild side, which is still pretty damned hot. What did you think? Uh, Mind blowing. It it, it was pleasure and pain to an extraordinary degree. And now, you know, you know what I like are opportunities to kind of have a bunch of different options within one meal frame. So the hot pot allows you to put the eel or the veggies or the this or the that. Um, And then your tongue is numb and it all kind of tastes the same (laughs) after a while. But I really, I viscerally remember the feeling of those peppers themselves. Like, do you know what they're called? Yeah, uh, they're huajiao or flower peppers. The the Sichuan peppercorns, they're uh, dried berries from the prickly ash plant. As you could probably tell, they've been used medicinally for centuries. That actually predated the, the, the chili pepper in Sichuan. So that was an effect in Sichuan well before it was hot, 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 spicy. It was hot, 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 numbing. And as you saw, man, for dental work, those are genius. (laughs) <laughs> yes. No, I, I remember like my first meal because we had a fixer on that show. So a fixer is obviously a local person who kind of helps us understand where to go and what to do and um, how to work with the government a lot of the times. But I remember my first meal and I was like, 
that feeling came across my tongue and it was just like, <laughs> what is happening? And we all kind of were just talking and eating and thinking about work. And then slowly, uh, you know, each one of us was having this realization of this sensation. I guess the fixer was used to working with a lot of crews who, and just enjoyed it immensely. Like every meal, like loved watching everybody's reactions to different things. That generally speaking, if you go to a finer restaurant, you know, they're fine tuning their cuisine. They will grind the Sichuan peppercorn to such a level that enhances is what they've cooked rather than in you go to a hole in the wall and I'm generalizing here that's basically cracking it and and putting large chunks of the peppercorn in the food such that when you crunch down on it you go oh shit, here it comes yeah and then you've got to wait for the feeling to go away so you can taste anything else yeah, I, I love your knowledge and experience of Chinese food and Chinese culture. I, that's one of the reasons I enjoy what you do. That's why I'm here. Cause I just, I love people who become incredibly passionate about a place and a particular aspect of it, because I feel like then I'm traveling with you and I'm having this experience through your, you know, your writing or your, your awesome videos. Well, I appreciate that. But by also, you know, we, we could all read books. That That's all it is. I'm just spouting out stuff that I, uh, that I record in my mind. And sometimes I don't even want the knowledge. You're, you are unique in the pantheon of guests so far on Sauce and Translation, Megan. Unlike anybody else I've spoken to, my previous guests, you and I have never met or spoken, uh, but we have, however, corresponded. And you've been very gracious with your words on my writing, and you've nudged me in the good directions about the right people to pitch uh, my erstwhile attempts at travel shows to. Mo but moreover, uh, you've been like a, a go-to model uh, for how to travel the world with optimal knowledge and fun. In my perspective, you're bringing to life that level of enlightenment. How have you handled this last period of non travel during the Corona times? Well, first of all, that's all very, very nice of you to stay. Uh, secondly, that gig and traveling with the people that I did, everybody from the locals to the fixers to the crew, we were all part of that experience. And so I was really lucky to have that dynamic going on um, to share everything with, including good, bad, ugly foods. Um, but in terms of pandemic and quarantine, I mean, it was, it's, I had kind of slowed down traveling a little bit for a while. I had spent so many years on the road, out in the world that I felt like I was missing some other parts of life, like kind of the deeper hard parts where, you know, my dearest friend's father passed away and I should have been there for her. Like there were these other layers of things. And so that is when I kind of started to bring myself home. I mean, that lasted for a short time on the first round because I ended up coming back to New York and then leaving two years later and going to Argentina for three years. Uh, but then we came back and we've been in Brooklyn now for 10 years and, you know, we still travel during that time, just not nearly as much. Um, but I'll tell you what has kept me sane. And this is legit. The truth. I live in this, um, part of Brooklyn called Kensington and the people on my street come from all around the world. Honestly, we've got everybody, we've got people from Bangladesh and Italy and Jamaica and Russia and Somalia and Germany. And so because of that, that need in me to connect to people from different walks of life and different points of view, it's almost literally on my doorstep. We have a backyard and nobody's built tall fences to separate your own private land. Everybody keeps their fences low and we wake up, we wave at each other. And Rosa, who lives next door, unfortunately, her husband passed away, but he has an old grapevine between our house and he used to make grappa in the basement, you know, <laughs> <laughs> inviting my son to come over and squish grapes with him. Um, so for me, that is how I have leveled out. And we've come probably even more together because of COVID. Did that, um, this may be too on the nose, but did that affect how you were able to eat? Uh, were, was it, is it a sharing culture as far as uh, food goes yard to yard or did you stick to your own? Um, I mean, at first, I think everybody was like batting down the hatches, you know, just figure out what the heck is going on. And then certain, maybe a holiday would come up. So at Ramadan, there's a family from Bangladesh. And at the end of it all, when they're celebrating, we they pass over food to us over the fence. And so we had we have had those moments. And across the street, um, one of my neighbors who's, um, where is he from? I think he's Swiss and Filipino. 
and he's a jazz musician. And so wow. he started performing on this front and he's like world-class jazz musician would start performing in front of his house and bring friends over. So by the time summer rolled around and numbers were down a little, and we understood more how to protect one another and ourselves, he started um, doing these concerts. And so we were all kind of in flow and there, you know, we don't live in like a very restaurant popular. We're not the destination for restaurants. Okay. Right, right, but the right. ones that we do have are really great. And so they would hear about it in advance and come by with food that people could buy. And we all just wanted to support anybody who was local and just trying to keep the doors open for the last year. Wow, that is fantastic. Having the the world come to you and actually feeding your soul with things like impromptu jazz concerts. Yeah. That's, uh, you know, I don't often talk about it, but feeding the soul uh, during this era has been as important, if not more. The last time you did travel, do you remember what you ate? I had a, a series of kind of unfortunate but well-meaning travels. One was to Canada in February, just before all of this went down. And then I was also in Mexico City just before that. And my friend arrived unwell. So I, I had so many plans for us, man. I had researched every place I was planning to eat. She wasn't there to do that. She was there to take pictures of architecture. I was like, yeah, but on the side, we're just going to eat. And um, she arrived already unwell. And so what I got to understand was the Mexico City healthcare system. <laughs> I was a sad irony to the the kind of last fun trip I had. Um, before that, I would say was Morocco, Marrakesh. Mm. My husband and I went there to celebrate 20 years together. Just woohoo! In it, <laughs> we met when we were 10. <laughs> held hands in the schoolyard. <laughs> You know, it is what it is. Yeah. But yeah, and the food in Marrakesh is like, that's a wonderland of sights and smells and tastes and everything from, you know, Bastilla and soups and everything. That was just decadent. It is. Do you remember your favorite bite? I, I've got it my own. That's why I'm asking. But do you, your favorite bite from Marrakesh? Favorite bite? That's a tough one. I know. No, I couldn't give you a favorite bite. I will say their orange juice tastes 10 times better than any orange juice on the planet. Something about those oranges, or maybe it's like where I was drinking it made them incredible. But one bite, I want to hear your bite. Uh, so our trip, we started in Fez, spent a few days there, and then took a god-awful trip across the desert. I had been sick uh, just leaving Fez, and so it was miserable for me. But the bookends of the trip were, were great. Fez was a wonderland, as you said, Marrakesh is. Marrakesh, also a wonderland, but I only spent a day there. That night at the hotel, we're, we're in a little library, and the library was converted into a dining room. Nonetheless, the best Bastilla I ever had. Mm -hmm. It was not a Bastilla at all. What they did was they, they took the bread on which you would find a Mexican torta and they put cinnamon sugar butter on either side Ooh. of the torta. And then they took the stewed chicken that would be inside of a Bastilla and layered it. So you're eating this Moroccan Mexican sandwich and it was no. fan fantastic best bite okay. best bite now i have to go okay i feel that because it's the cinnamon in it that mm -hmm. i find such a wonderful component and now i'm annoyed i'm gonna tell you why because i i will get this now it's in my head that this sandwich exists did you have the camel i i did not have camel in morocco i definitely did have it in the uae or maybe it was oman i've had camel twice i had camel in Oman and it was um, like a camel burger and you would like you'd go to a food truck here and just get a camel burger. And then I also had it in China on the Silk Road, which was, you know, both times are emotional because those camels, they've got the eyelashes and they're looking at you like, um, but it was good. It was interesting. Something about a burger. I think I would do it. I like you. I've got emotional about the concept of it because walking around the the markets in in Fez and Marrakech, you're presented with a camel head more often than would make you comfortable. I mean, there they yeah. a, a lot of places is just a big old camel head looking at you walking by. <laughs> but yeah. if I'm served a burger and I've done it with yak burger, ostrich burger, you know, you name the game meat. I, I've had a burger. We all have had a variety of burgers. Something yeah. about the format of a burger kind of forgives other sins. I don't know. I don't know what it is. Yeah. That reminds me of being in Kuwait at a mall. The time that I went, you know, the mall was the place to be. They had the food court. You could have been in Ohio, except for it would be like Long John Silver's, McDonald's, and then local place 
So we went to the local place in the, in the food court and it was a sheep's brain. And we were like, well, let's try this. And then they put it on a panini and then, and they, it's kind of, you know, a panini has got that kind of smushed, <laughs> smushed construction. And then they put so much garlic, olive, like mayonnaise on it that it was, you know, delicious, but very chewy, a lot of chewiness. I did the, I was on a, a food oh. tour in Istanbul and, and that's, that's one of the, the tour guides favorite little stops where you stop and they, it's the sheep brain and they take the whole head apart and like the bravado part of the tour is who's willing to take a toothpick of the brain. And of course, uh, in, in an odd fashion, I did, I'm not usually the icky guy, um, but I, I just didn't know what the texture would be like. And that's why I did it out of sheer curiosity. And I do regret doing it because it was exactly that. Take anything, add a condiment, put it between bread and smush it till it's a panini. Yes. Okay. That, make, <laughs> that makes it okay. So I guess any organ meat, any off all, right? Okay. Do it. Yeah. I'm just not usually that guy. And which surprises a lot of listeners. No, I, that's something I've thought a lot about and struggled with as, you know, as a travel show presenter. I don't even know what to call myself as Megan who travels and somebody paid her for a period of time <laughs> um, is like, I, I really wanted to show up and honor wherever I was. That was my main goal. And whatever that was, I really intended to not project my own bias onto as much as I possibly could. Granted, there are definitely moments that were more out of left field than others. But I was also a teacher in Japan before I did all of this. After I graduated from college, I lived in Japan for a year. And I remember my students asking me about turkeys. They're like, do you all really eat that? That is the most disgusting looking creature I could ever imagine. And I was like, yeah, it's pretty standard over there. And they were like, ah! and I loved that moment because you know, we all have our kind of projections and presuppositions of of what to eat and not to eat. I never knew that about the Japanese uh, culinary. I never thought about it. How do they feel about turkeys? That's something I learned today. Well, junior high school students in Yasato Machi <laughs> in Ibaragi Ken in Japan, not keen. <laughs> Being uh, someone who loves uh, and has been to China as many times as I have, um, I always kind of eschewed Japan, particularly because I lived there. The teachers that I was teaching with, the Chinese English teachers that I was teaching with, were of the age that they were kids during the revolution. So you didn't talk about Japan. You know, it was a weird thing. I was not ignoring Japan, but it just never entered my mind because I was like, well, if I'm flying that far, I'm going to be in China. Like, why yeah. would I, but, but, <laughs> but, China. but after that first visit to Japan, forget about everything I thought I knew. I didn't, yeah. I still don't even know what I think I know about Japan. I don't either. And I've been obsessed with it for 25 years. It constantly changes. Japan is one of those places where you think, again, you think, you know what you're going for and you have a list of things that you need to eat this trip. And I always have that list of things I need to eat like a checklist. And then something brand new is there. Something new and sparkly is that the new fad. And you're like, well, where did that come from? Do you have a favorite travel food story? That's so hard. Howie. I know, I know, I know, I know. That's what I thought. Like I was actually, I didn't even think about it until I'm, it was 1230 and I'm like, okay, I'm going to get myself a cup of coffee. Oh crap. She's got thousands of stories. What is she going to do? Not oh. my problem. That's what I said to myself. Not my problem. Ah! <laughs> Gosh, I don't know because it's like anything from the most amazing bowl of noodle soup when I was on a motorcycle journey of my own in Laos. Like there's something about this one bowl of noodle soup I had this one day in Laos that I will never forget. And then being invited, like it happened regularly in China, especially that when we were filming there, you know, if we were in a smaller town or medium -sized, maybe even a medium sized city, the government is very much a part of the filming process. So we had to have dinner in every town we went to with the different levels of bureaucrats and leaders. And they would be long, you know, what they were so special. You know, they were really fun. Um, and I love that aspect. I love the aspect. Like and in Italy, my God, listen, that show we shot sequentially. Sometimes we kind of go out of order sure. um, and piece it together. But sometimes it's like 
this one where it was chronological, you can literally see me gain 15 pounds. Probably it was a three and a half week shoot. And I could not say no to anything. And like, we would have to have, and again, it's like a, like food is a big part of connecting. So we would have to have lunch with whoever we had filmed with in the morning. And then we would move on to the next story. And no matter what time we finished, we had to have dinner because otherwise it was more, it felt transactional and, and they weren't about that. So then I would be like at 11 o'clock at night, like, oh, pasta, this is the, <laughs> and it would be like the most sublime pasta I'd ever had. Now, correct me if I'm wrong. I want to know about that bowl of noodles you ate on the back of a motorcycle in Laos, or you went on a motorcycle to get this bowl of noodles in Laos. Noodles happened while we were on our two week motorcycle journey through Laos, but not riding so, on a motorcycle. Huh? You're not eating. No, I didn't noodles. eat while riding on the oh, bike. Whoo. Pulled over because that would be skills. That would be like some mad skills if I could delicately eat. Well, that's <laughs> that's why I wanted to go back to it. That was very <laughs> that was very confusing for me. I was like, I was trying to picture it the whole time you're talking to Italy. I'm like, but how the hell did she eat the noodles on the back of the motorcycle? <laughs> well, they do a lot of fried bananas <laughs> and those I did eat on the back of the bike for hours as well. So tell me about this, uh, not only the journey, but tell me about that bowl of noodles. If someone says in the very beginning of tell me your favorite travel food story, something about a bowl of noodles, journey, motorcycle, Laos, and then moves on to Italy all of a sudden. Like, no, 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 go back. That bowl was special. Um, well, I think it's because you've stirred me up. And so all of these memories are kind of flooding back of different times and places and this missingness. I have this feeling of missing the world. And that was just one of those incredible journeys. You know, um, Globe Trekker, when we first started doing it, it was in the mid to late 90s. And we just got on the bike and we didn't see anybody else who looked like us. And we didn't have a place to stay. And I didn't have a, I didn't even look at the lonely planet. It was just like, <laughs> we're going to follow this route and we had nowhere to go and nowhere to be. And so we would pull over into a small town and find the little local shop. And the best thing of going through some of these small towns were the kids, because they would kind of know something strange was coming from miles before we had arrived. And there'd just be kids waiting and they like, had the most energy energetic wave they would do like sometimes like a double hand a leg up kind of waving and screaming hello hello or whatever and just pulling over and the feeling and this one family and one kid in particular like takes me by the hand and the next thing we know we're sitting with their family and they're all kind of staring at me and then they give me the noodles and they've got the mint and the nuts and the things and the things and the so I feel like that bowl of noodles was the most beautiful bowl of noodles I think I'd ever had. And do you know why that's such a beautiful bowl of noodles? I'll tell you the last 45 seconds. That's why that bowl of noodles was so beautiful because it wasn't a bowl of noodles. It was context. It was a painting. It was sounds. It was smells. You just described exactly that setting and I can see it. That picture is so distinct. I find that where adults will be very welcoming. In a lot of places in the world, there's nothing like the kids. The kids are always so interested in just playing with you, which there's a universal language, right? You get off the motorbike, you're kicking a soccer ball, people are high-fiving you. You know, the kids, it's, it's such a wonderful energy that, that bursts you into that climate. And you're like, okay, I get it. Now I can just banter with the adults. Once the kids acclimate you to what's going on, you're like, okay, cool. Whether they think I'm a celebrity, whether I think they're celebrities, we're all just hanging out now because I kicked the soccer ball. We're good. Yeah. We're friends. We're buddies. I love that. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Those, that's it. That's all about, that's what it's all about for me. Those moments. I, I know this is the weeds, but mint and nuts. That's a very generic term. It was, was it peanuts? I'm guessing Laos was, it, it had to be peanuts, probably right? peanuts. I would yeah. say, I think yeah. it was like 50 cents a bowl. If that. Right. I don't think actually, I don't think in that one, I think that's where we discover this is like a staple everyday part of their cuisine. And I think that one, they really just invited us and we thought, do we need to do something here? And they were like, no, we're now family. And then by the next village, we were just seeking out, you know, how you were saying the next bowl of pasta yeah. in Italy that will yeah. be the best. That was the rest of the trip. It's like, all right, let's see the noodles in this town. <laughs> what about this town? You know, something I find about uh, identifying something as, oh my God, this is the best X that I've tasted, or my God, that beverage Y was the best 
why I've ever had. The problem with that is that then you end up chasing a dragon, which as you know, if you're chasing a dragon, the philosophy behind that is you're never, ever going to find it again. I find with foods, and we're talking about like an Asian bowl of noodles or an Italian bowl of pasta, I find that there's no need because the very next bowl of whatever you have is like, oh my God, that's the best. Oh my God, that's the best. And it just keeps going up. So I don't know what the analogy would be. It's not chasing the dragon. It's a uh, uh, slaying the dragon. I'm going to continue slaying the dragon because every um, every bowl is a dragon. Holding hands with the dragon. Holding from... hands with the dragon. But those are two different uh, cultures, right? So Western culture would be <laughs> slaying the dragon because dragons are dangerous and they spit fire. But Eastern tradition has a dragon as a uh, an affable soul who sprays water and puts out fires. So mm. y- y- I would hold an Asian dragon's hand. Yes. Yeah. I would okay. slay an Italian dragon. <laughs> Megan, do you have a worst? food travel story? Uh, That's so hard. I love it. I love how hard of a question that is. And it's consistent. It's hard. Is it really? Everybody has trouble with this one. I can give you like a a bunch of I got six. And (laughs) because definitely my, it took a while to earn like my iron stomach. It took some years. You know, my first show was in India And the rule was don't eat food that you don't see cooked in front of you. So you can eat street food, but you need to watch it being cooked. Or, you know, we had a lot. And this was my, I don't know, it was was my very first show and the crew, they were super professional, had a lot of experience. So I was kind of following along with them. And then they, we filmed in Udaipur and we went to a really fancy hotel, like a five-star hotel. And the crew were like, don't worry about it. This is the place you can just take, you know, we can all have whatever at this hotel, honest to God, the next day on the plane, all five of us are just sick, sick, sick as can be. Um, I have like this small moment where I, I'm from the United States and I eat peanut butter. Okay. That is a confession. And so when we were traveling, if we were working super fast and super hard and didn't get to stop for lunch or for whatever reason, I always had my backup peanut butter, which everybody made fun of me for until we got stranded (laughs) for like nearly 36 hours in a place where there was nothing to eat except for like maybe some old, old crisps in a local shop. There was nothing. And I was like, who's laughing now, people? Because at least I had my peanut butter. But I'm not bragging about that. I'm just saying. <laughs> that might count as a best travel food story. I was and forever will be a huge fan of Anthony Bourdain. Mm-hmm. I just thought he rocked the world. And I loved how he did it as a New York, the New Yorker that he he was. And I was behind him on a publicity thing years ago, like, I don't know, 10 years ago. And so he was ahead of me. And so every place I went, they would say, because Discovery Channel aired his show and my show. So we do these Discovery Channel things and we'd show up in a new country and he'd, he'd be like, Anthony Bourdain loved this. <laughs> Anthony Bourdain loved this. <laughs> And then they would all sit and watch me as I just compare my reaction to whatever Anthony Bourdain had, had thoroughly enjoyed. I did actually end up appreciating bird's nest soup, which I wasn't sure was up my alley. I mean, I could kind of understand that the intensity and origin story, perhaps. Well, yeah, I mean, it's it's true of the origin story. And if, and if you're listening to this and you don't know what bird's nest soup is, it's uh, the spittle of a swallow bird. Did you enjoy it? Because I can, I can tell you suggested alternatives that are easier to get and not expensive. <laughs> yeah, yes. Um, I don't know that I necessarily enjoyed it, but what I really appreciate um, about my experience traveling with the show was I don't necessarily, I wouldn't necessarily have had these opportunities to really experience so many very different cuisines, tastes, flavors, everything. So I, I'm glad that I tried it. You know that you, you remember this story? Did you, do you know Ian Wright? Who's another host of the show? I know of Ian Wright. I would love to know Ian Wright. Oh, uh, he's awesome. Um, he's a vegetarian. And he also was really well known for trying everything that, you know, anybody could offer him anything and he would eat it. And I don't know if it was, I don't think it was Iceland or Greenland. 
a very cold place. It could have been somewhere in Northern Canada. Uh, he was working with a contributor who was like, here we eat this part of the seal and it's really special. And so they give him some part of the seal, which doesn't sound good and doesn't look good. And Ian, because he's a deep hearted person was like, of course, if this is what people do here, I'm going to be in this experience. And he takes the bite and it's just like the worst thing ever. And then the contributor started laughing his head off. Like, ah, we don't actually eat that at all. And he tricked him. <laughs> oh my God. That is so mean. That is you so might mean. have to check with him. If this airs and you hear this, <laughs> Ian, right. Uh, you can confirm or deny this story. Uh, Cause it's legendary. I heard it from somebody who heard it from somebody. And so. Ian, if you're listening to this, please, please contact me. I would love, <laughs> <laughs> I, I want to do I'm on a very special episode of sauce and translation. Well, I have, this is, I feel like, I'm not sure if it, I don't want to be rude, right, by any way, shape, or form, but, and I'm trying to not disclose who I was working with at the time, but I was on a shoot in China, and we were in a very small town, and the director had been really bossy with me, like, just really like you're walk funny. You should walk differently. Like, and I'm not an actress. I'm just me. And so I was like, don't take it personally. Anyway, we get to this like dinner and it's the whole small town have gathered and it's the beautiful meal is being presented. And there was a soup and it was given the, I guess the claw of the bird was the pride, was the most honored part of the soup the meal and they gave it to me. And it was a really special moment for me because I could thank my host for honoring me, but I wasn't actually the boss. The director was the boss. That's brilliant. So I, that is like, brilliant. I just really want to honor our director who <laughs> is the leader of everything here. There you that, go. Is, <laughs> that is fantastic. Here's the chicken foot. It was, it was it a big, like it was it a, a talon. No, was it, it a wasn't team? a chicken foot. It wasn't a chicken foot. It was Smaller and claw ear. I don't know which fowl had given up its right or left or both appendages. But, was, but the guest of honor was my dear director. I mean, yeah. <laughs> and you know what? Here's the good news. They have the same exact story. The only difference True. is they truly believed that they were the guest of honor. <laughs> When the cameras weren't rolling, what did Megan do? Hmm. When the pressure was off and she wasn't presenter Megan, and it, maybe it was not dependent on where you were, but what did you do and did it depend on where you were? I mean, marginally upon where I was, because, you know, sometimes traveling alone as a woman, I couldn't do certain things or go certain places the same way. Um, but that wasn't often generally I'd hit, I would go to the closest cafe when we would finish, like whatever was local where I could just sit and either have a cup of tea or a beer and some peanuts and just look around for myself without anybody else's, you know, attention or having to work or generate anything, just sit and observe and take in the life of wherever I was. And that could be in like the smallest town or a hotel lobby or something in the youth hostel we were staying in, just kind of that moment of sitting and watching. That was generally my go-to. And I also really like to buy fabric. So if I had any time <laughs> off, I would be trying to buy some local fabric somewhere. I can appreciate the observer status. And one doesn't often think that person's not getting the chance to observe while they're presenting on TV. If someone's thinking, oh man, best job in the world, get to go travel around the world. But when that camera's on, you're not actually absorbing what's around you. So I, I, it's, it's heartening to know that at the end of the day, when they turn the power off, you sit down and you start looking around. That, that to me is encouraging. I never took for granted what was happening. I couldn't believe it and pinched myself for the entire nearly 20 <laughs> years that I did that job. Funnily enough, my last show was in the Rust Belt of the United States. Um, and I'm born in Ohio. So I was like, what? I mean, I'm happy to go back, but I've gone all around the world for this show. And I got on like an hour and a half flight from New York and was in Cleveland. Um, and I learned a lot. I learned a lot. It was just all of it was such a gift. I'm super grateful for it. 
since you were a denizen of the food scene in Argentina, I, I do have to ask you a question that's been uh, clawing at my brain for a few years now. Morning, noon, and night, I could live on empanadas alone. Big, so big fried vegetables, cheeses, meats, you name it, dessert. Okay. Help me understand Argentinian pizza. If you're listening out there and you don't understand what Argentinian pizza is, take pizza that you have in your brain and crumble it up and toss it out the window. Argentinian pizza is shaped similarly. It's generally round. It, it might strike you as closer to Chicago style immediately because it's quite thick. But what you come to realize is that the top three quarters of this thing is cheese so that when you try to pull a slice away, the whole thing just sort of gloops down to the plate. And you wonder, how in the world is this a pizza? So Megan McCormick, as a last official travel guide act in your life, please help me understand why Argentinian pizza? Why? Oh, I can't do that. And I, I love it and have many friends there, but what the heck happened? I mean, the Italian influence in Argentina is undeniable, right? But it's otherwise and flawless. This is my point. You have a bowl of pasta in Argentina. It's glorious. Oh, come on. Oh, okay. I, 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 th I think that's my opinion. All right. But with the pizza, what a call it a cheese pie, something don't call it a pizza, but what it's, it's, it's a molten cheese that it's, it's, you know, easily 78% of the mass of this thing. How is that pizza? What I learned from living in Argentina in terms of food and especially where we were in Mendoza, which is a beautiful thriving small city. It's the wine region. Um, lots of tourism, um, lots of traditions. And also they eat seasonally. So that's when I kind of, for the first time in my life, came into the rhythm of food and the season in my body. So when your body needs extra vitamin C, you know, it's raining down from the trees in forms of pomegranates and oranges, you know, yeah. and, and if you want strawberries, you're only going to get them for a month or asparagus. I remember we were just waiting for asparagus and then it's so delicious. Like that first piece of asparagus that is yeah. so fresh and it's just been brought to the market and we just eat it for a month. And you're like, I don't want to look at asparagus <laughs> for a year. And here's the good news. It won't be back for a year. So there you go. <laughs> We've reached that part of the show, Megan, where I have five fill in the blanks. Are you ready? I am ready. Blank will be my last meal. You know, that's so hard. And I'm going to tell you something. I would have said, like, for my, my road answer forever was like a perfect steak with hollandaise sauce and cream spinach and a dirty martini somewhere in like Manhattan. That was always like my, when I grow up, I'm a sophisticated person. This is my email. But I realize that's not true anymore. I eat, I don't know, I eat differently. I don't eat as much meat and it's all changing. So then I thought about it. You know what it would be? Truffles, black truffles on scrambled eggs with toast. Oh, that's so good. Yeah. I remember the first time I actually tried proper, proper truffles and I haven't had like the proper, proper situation very often, but we were <laughs> filming in Northern Italy and they, we were like, oh, it's one of those days where nothing was going well. And especially when it's food, those stories are really hard to get the timing right. And they're also time consuming and we're not specifically a food show. So we get, it's like, Every food story we know costs us in time. So we finally, we get a set of, oh, the, 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 and they give it to me. And I'm like, I try truffles for the first time. And I'm like, holy cannoli, like, what is going on? This is amazing. And I'm like talking about it and I'm eating it and I finish it. And then I picked up the plate and I licked the plate. And I don't even like remember, like, I wasn't intentionally trying to lick every last flavor off. But um, so that's kind of, I think, more of where I would be. But even that would change. And randomly, I love papaya salad. That is also something I would put. Can I have papaya salad and then drop? And then ooh, drop ooh, ooh, that's rough. Egg? You're it's asking wrong. me to. I know it's wrong. Ooh, ooh, I don't know. Because you're talking about green papaya, like a Thai green papaya salad. Yeah, it's so wrong. Yeah, but it's so good, too. So, okay. So maybe there's some way to match the two. Maybe there, maybe there's a sorbet course in between or something like yeah. that. I used to brainstorm, like, if I had a private jet and I could wake up in the morning and eat different meals in different parts of the world, I thought I would start with this breakfast, like a full Scottish breakfast 
on this small island um, called Sky. And then I was going to go to Kenya to have the seafood platter that I had that was absolutely phenomenal. And then it was dinner and the time differences that was kind of throwing me off on how to wind up the day. But that's actually an, that's an excellent game to play. Like, where how would you map it out to to be resilient to the differences in the hours? So your body would be still awake. So how do you get sleep, get on a plane, take the travel time and the time differences into consideration to get the most meals out of like a 24 hour period? Like that is an interesting physics problem and a math problem and a geometry problem. (laughs) I cook blank to impress people. Howie, I'm not known uh, throughout the microphone for my cooking. But what I want to do when I impress people, to be honest, is I call my friend Carly, who's from Argentina, and we set up the barbecue outside and he's an asador. So we get the best, you know, from his Argentine butcher, the best slices of meat. And he does that. And then I do some of the sides with my other Argentine friend, Grace. And this is kind of how we mostly impress people, because otherwise uh, I have I'm not the best. Well, what do I do to impress people? I get the A team together. I do. I call my people. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. That's good. Okay. Um, and this may be a similar answer to your first, but I cook blank to comfort myself. This past year, the, the in the in the quarantine days, my main go-to have been lentils. In it's either like the the stew that kind of base like a version of the stew from Allison Roman in the New York Times. But doll, my son ate doll like five years ago for the first time, and he fell madly in love. And so my goal has been to make a, a doll that he really likes. And he's very particular. He was like too much lemon or too little this or too much. So it's still a constant work in progress. But we ate that a lot this last year. If I could erase one food from the earth, it would be blank. This is not popular, but I am never going to eat an anchovy directly. That's I know people love them. Any type of small hairy fish in the can, I have tried to love you, but it's just not working for me. So I could do without that. No, I got it. I got it. It's a it's it's that thing where you know that they could also melt into sauces. Does that ever make you paranoid? Well, no, I do know that. And I, I'm okay. Like, I'm not going to reject a meal based on it as an ingredient, but in terms of like fish and the tin. I think that what, that what you're trying to say, Megan, is that you would erase pre-melted anchovies from the earth. Yes. No, okay. not from the earth because they deserve their life, but from the, like me eating them. From the Megan eating realm you would erase pre-melted anchovies. Yes. Now, this is not going to change your mind. Like I said, we're you and I are both uh, of the same age. I think that you know uh, I'm not a spring chicken. I, it's, it would be tough to someone to convince me that I will all of a sudden wake up tomorrow and enjoy pickled cucumbers. It's not going to happen. Oh. Mm-hmm. Yeah, see? Yeah. It always makes somebody sad. I hate pickles. I would erase them in a heartbeat. Ooh. Yeah, in a heartbeat. Uh, and they never swam, so put that in your pipe and smoke it um so so here's here's what i'm saying Uh, if you get a proper toasted slice of baguette anchovy or sardine and cream cheese oh my god no changes everything completely little pickled red onion Oh, 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 oh the last but certainly not the least fill in the blank is blank is for dinner tonight (laughs) dull (laughs) go figure yeah, it's like, oh, that's the easiest thing I can pull together. We just got back from Boston. Um, so I have nothing in the house. So doll it is. It is. So doll nothing is, in the house, doll. but you, you've got dry lentils up the wazoo, right? I mean, you've just got oh, yeah. like stocks of now uh, black lentils. So you're doing the doll with um, red, I, yellow. You know what? I think I'm down to the red. I'm in the red category today. <laughs> you're in the red. Megan, this is it. I, I really appreciate your time. Uh, this has been uh, as fun as I thought it would be. Not that I've ever imagined us being on a podcast together. That, that this, is, this has been great. Yeah, I appreciate it. You're wonderful to talk to you. You have helped me remember um, in, that, in a very visceral way so many of these experiences that are just kind of like 
part of who I am now. And it's so fun to talk about and to reminisce. So thank you for that. I appreciate I Hey, no sweat. I love talking about these things and I often do get uh, fairly obsessive and into the weeds on them. So I, I often appreciate, and then particularly today when someone is comfortable with those weeds, it really is. And you can, and you can tell that you are someone who uh, loves to talk about those details and you've painted some vivid pictures for us all. Um, so until next time that we chat, and I would love to do it live someday. Definitely. When we have the baguette with the fish and the cream cheese and the yada, yada, yada. You bet. Thank yada, you, yada, yada. All right. Thank you, Megan. Bye-bye. <laughs> Bye. To all of you wonderful, intelligent listeners out there, remember to subscribe to this show, follow me on Instagram, and find our books with your favorite seller. Those are One Pan to Rule Them All, Kiss My Casserole, How to Cook Anything in Your Dutch Oven, Chinese Street Food, and the forthcoming Off the Top of My Head, Recipes, Rants, and Ravings of an American Cook Obsessing in Barcelona. Until next time, stay saucy and eat well.